Hello, Mike. Hello. Hey, how's it going there? Ah, good, good, guys. Awesome. So, uh, yeah, we're uh, we're live on the air right now. We were just about to explain the story of how this came about because it's quite a weird one, right? It's <laughs> it's very weird. So it sounds sort of like it's uh, pretty typical for you, then. <laughs> the, it certainly isn't typical. This one, I would say. Um, I, I meant the, the weird description. Oh, the weirdness. Yeah, the weirdness is definitely very typical of this show. So uh, a couple of weeks ago, we uh, placed a random prank call and um, accidentally got Mr. Mike Rinder on the line. And yeah, and that's how that came about. And um, he actually has a much better sense of humor than most of the people that we call. And uh for some crazy reason, agreed to be here with us tonight. So uh, thank you very much for that, Mike. You're, you're most welcome. So, um, I, I, I always enjoy a good laugh. Yes, well, ho- hopefully we'll provide a good laugh at least. Um, and, uh, and, please, you know, and please excuse me if I annoy you with my coughing. I have a cough that, that seems to get irritated when I, when I chuckle. Oh right, okay. So, so hopefully there'll be a lot of coughing. You're not going to be coughing much tonight. Then. If he's if he's not coughing, we're in trouble, guys. Okay. So, there yeah. you go. If, that's if, that's gonna that's gonna be like the, your, the little meter that's gonna sit in the corner of the screen. The cough meter. The cough meter. <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay. So um, we have a few questions for you. Um, hopefully, they're going to make you cough. Um, these were the ones that you were supposed to clear with me beforehand, right? Uh, yes, I was kind of supposed to, but uh, Shit. yeah, <laughs> we, we decided to take a risk. I mean, you, you you know a little bit about this show already. We would never say anything offensive or, or weird or anything. So uh, <clears throat> yeah, um, yeah, and you can you can tell us to get fucked if you want to as well, Mike. Yeah, I mean, if, if you don't feel like laughing slash coughing, just tell us to get fucked. It's uh, completely fine on this show. Um, so um, maybe it'll be funny maybe it'll be educational maybe it'll just be downright offensive all the way through who knows um, yeah. so we had we had some viewers send in a few questions or a few listeners send in a few questions so we'll get to that in a moment people are blowing up in the chat apparently you are the king of funk's hero thanks king of funk um Okay, so for those that don't know, or for those that do know, um, you just got finished working on a documentary series with uh, Leah Romini, um, which is going to get the full name of it, Scientology and the Aftermath, uh, right? Um, Yeah, that's right. Well, actually, we we finished that last year. I just started, we just started working on uh, this year's episodes. Okay, so there's a season two to expect. Yes, sir. Awesome. So, yeah, if you're listening to this, if you haven't already, please go check that out. It is I spent this week watching it after work every night, and wow, it, it really is fantastic. Scientology and the Aftermath. Um, so I guess the first question is based around that, so let's keep it topical. Um, Leah Romini, um, is she really that hot in real life? And did you ever, you know, make any moves on her at all? And also, does she like British men at all? Uh, wow, you gotta, you gotta, like, counselor, you gotta break down your compound questions. <laughs> that was the most suitable opening question we could think of. I mean, you know. Okay, okay, part one, absolutely. Yes. Part, <laughs> yes. <laughs> part two, definitely not. Have you seen my wife? No, I haven't, actually. Um, we haven't uh, been. Well, you can look on Facebook. Oh, okay. Boom. I, we, we have, I have Mike. I have. That's the I, I, that's the correct answer to the go. question, I believe. Though that that is question one is correct. Um, question one is the that's the correct answer, and que- that question two is the correct answer too. Excellent. Yes. She. Um, <laughs> yeah. Is she listening by any chance, Mike? What's that? <laughs> is your wife listening by any chance? Oh, I, I very much doubt it. I, I happen to be in Los Angeles today, and she's home in Florida. I, I suspect okay. she's not listening. I mean, she was listening when we were, when you called me the first time. I put it on speaker because I, uh, I thought it was so funny, and she was standing there listening to it. And was she, she was, laughing? She, she was probably like, what the yeah. hell? 
<laughs> yes, she was. She was she she was laughing. Uh, she had to like turn around and walk out of the room a couple of times. She has a great sense. <laughs> <system. laughs> excellent, excellent. You're good. I'm, I'm she, she, would, she wouldn't be able to put up with me if she didn't. Uh, I get that. <laughs> yeah, you you have that same problem, <laughs> Doctor Charles. We know that, right? Yeah. You have to be very okay. careful about your opinions of Leah as as well, there, Doctor Charles. <laughs> Um, and as, as for as for the the Brits, I I don't know. I mean, her husband is around here somewhere, and he is. Uh, you wouldn't want to tangle with him, so I I suggest you guys kind of. Oh no! Okay. <laughs> All right. Moving moving swiftly on. Let's. Uh, let's uh, much, Macron, I did I did actually ask you to to shout out to Leah and uh, say respect. Yeah, Please. absolutely. No offense intended, Leah. She's uh, she's amazing, and she's amazing in the documentary for real. Um, oh, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think anybody ever gets offended by being asked if they're hot. No, exactly, exactly. Um, which leads me on to my next question. We're staying on the kind of celebrity theme here. Now, uh, this yeah. is a true story. My mother, who's listening right now, sent these two questions <laughs> in. <laughs> <laughs> and so I kind of I, this, is, this is by the way Mike this is James's Mother's Day present how lame is that that's her Mother's Day present is asking these two questions it's not really though thanks for using my real name there Dr. Charles that's uh, <laughs> that's great that's gonna that's gonna really help David and everybody else that's listening yeah, to I'm uh, very glad they're all down. listening this evening yep yep oh David knows who you are <laughs> yeah, I think he's outside right now um, I so my mother asked these two questions, and these are not controversial at all. Um, it's kind of two questions in one. Uh, what drugs is Tom Cruise really on, and when is John Travolta going to come out? Okay, part one. <laughs> you, you, do you love the compound questions, huh? Oh okay, yeah, absolutely. Part one, I, I try. Get, see, I'm very organized. I like to be. I like to make sure I respond to everything that you ask. Um, Part one, the drug that Tom Cruise is on, Scientology, Kool-Aid, Scientology flavored Kool-Aid. Wow. He, okay. He, he acts and reacts and does weird things based on what he thinks is an appropriate response to uh, impress his buddy David Miscavige. Part two, when is... When is John Travolta coming out of the closet? I didn't know he was in the closet. I think my mother knows things that not even we know. But uh... No, I mean, he has been out of the closet for I don't know how long. It's just there is nobody that, that publicly – he doesn't publicly acknowledge it for fear that – you know, Scientology is very homophobic. Yeah. Okay. He doesn't acknowledge it for that reason. But – you can't have as many stories as there have been and incidents uh, as there have been that – and I'm not saying that he is just homosexual. He's married. He has a you know, pretty hot-looking wife and he has kids. I, th I think he's probably most aptly uh, falls into the category of bisexual. But in – you know – I suppose your question is, or her, your mother's question, is that uh, when is he going to publicly admit that he's bisexual? And I don't think that will ever happen, but unless he leaves Scientology, because that would be an admission that he is uh, what's known in Scientology as aberrated, fucked up. It means fucked up, and uh, so he isn't going to do it, but. You know, the, the number of, of stories and articles that have been published already and his, uh, in many instances, uh, non-denial of them, I think it gives you a pretty, a pretty clear picture of where he's at. Wow. Can, can I okay. ask a spin-off question? Sorry to interrupt Macron, but can I ask a spin-off question uh, from that, Mike? And this this is, yes, I know this is sort of lightly touched on in the documentaries, but do, do does the Church of Scientology truly believe that it can actually revert homosexuality? Well, just, well, just so you know, I charge extra for spin-off questions. <laughs> That's fine. I'll get, just the checks your, in the phone. Get your credit oh, card okay. out there, Charles. Okay, good. Um, 
it, I don't know. That's a, that's a rather difficult question to answer. I, I guess the simple, the simplistic answer is yes. But in order to really understand what that means, you've got to kind of understand the mindset and the, the idea that um, being homosexual in Scientology it equates to being what's called low on the tone scale. And the tone scale is this invented uh, list of numbers that have little uh, emotions that go with them. Or they're called emotions yes. in Scientology, from anger to hate to uh, conservatism to uh, gleeful to ha all these different things. And one of them is, is called uh, covert hostility and Hubbard postulated that everybody who's a homosexual is in the the band called homosexuality which is quote unquote the most dangerous level that one can uh, be in and and interact with someone like that the, the entire theory of Scientology is auditing moves you up the tone scale so you so therefore, in Scientology, being 1.1 slash homosexual is low and bad, and auditing will move you up, and therefore, in theory, by being moved up the scale in auditing, you'll no longer be 1.1, so therefore you'll no longer be homosexual. And, and uh, would it be considered to be a crime? Because you hear crime mentioned a lot in the documentaries. So would it be considered to be a crime? <laughs> the homosexual um no not really not not like not like those things are described when they talk about crime in Scientology there's a list of offenses that are categorized as misdemeanors crimes and high crimes and they are the Scientology equivalents of the law this is what you are allowed to do this is what you're not allowed to do this is what you get busted for this is what you get get in big trouble for, et cetera, et cetera. Being, mm. being homosexual per se is not a crime, but it's, it's, that doesn't mean it's good. No, no, you're, you're the lowest of the low, essentially, and, and probably are treated as such. Yeah. Wow. Sorry, okay. uh, to interject there, Macron, you can move on now. That's, that's quite all right. I think that's going to um, answer my mother's question quite thoroughly anyway. Um, <laughs> so... We have some uh, a couple of light-hearted questions before we move on to a couple of questions from the listeners. We tried not to have too many for you here, but uh, um, the next question is: Who is your favorite comedian, and why? Besides me, obviously. Um, Ricky Gervais. Oh wow! Okay, nice. Ricky Gervais. Good call. Fan. Yeah, yeah, big fan of That's Ricky awful. Gervais. Is that what you said? Awful. No, good call. Good call. Oh. Yeah, he's oh. uh, he's fantastic. We're all obviously he's quite big in Britain, so uh, yeah, great answer, yeah. great answer. He, um, he is he is definitely my favorite. I I watch everything that I can. I watched all the episodes, the original Office. I I mean, I watched everything he's ever done. I I uh, really appreciate his his sense of of what's funny. Yes, definitely. Uh, I like the way he can laugh at himself as much as anyone else. It's something we try and uh, do, obviously. Um, have you well, seen the shows with well, Carl Pilkington? Yes, of course. Yeah, some say I look a little bit like him in real life. Yeah. I was just going to bring that up. <laughs> <laughs> you look a little like him? Yes. I'm yeah. sorry. You just said. <laughs> <laughs> Um, on the same intellect level as well, I might add. Thanks, <laughs> thanks there, Dr. Charles. Thanks for adding that. <laughs> have, you, have you been on any trips recently? Uh, not recently, no, but I think the Macron show on tour could be, could be the next big thing. So we'll I see about that. I think you know, send you on an adventure to Egypt. I'm, I'm definitely down for that, yeah. We need, uh, <laughs> need a few donations from the listeners and we'll do that. <laughs> um... <laughs> Which moves me on to another quick question, um, because yeah. of obviously the type of show that we do. Have you ever made a prank phone call? Um, 
No, I haven't. No, but, I haven't. I but, mean, I've made, I've made, um, no, no, I just haven't. I was trying to answer with some, you know, wise ass, I sound cool because I have, but I haven't. Okay, that's fair, that's fair enough. That's, uh, that's probably the correct answer as well when you're on the air. Um, yeah. And it brings me quickly onto another comedy related question. So, you're originally from Australia, I believe. Um, I noticed you kind of have a sort of hybrid Australian American accent going on. Um, well, it's not, it's not very hybrid anymore. It's more like mongrel. Okay. <laughs> That's, I get the same thing said about me. That's kind of like Dr. Charles, yeah. Um, so the question was, which country do you think has the funniest accent, obviously besides the British? Um, funniest accent? Uh, I don't know. I, I, I get a kick out of Pakistanis. Okay. Excellent. Oh, we have got to call the Seacrest. <laughs> yeah, we have... Um, we have uh, a few people that we like to call on the regular um, that's kind of related to that answer. So I'll, uh, yeah, I'll maybe send you some details about that. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm sure that that wasn't, that wasn't like a politically correct answer, but it was the uh, top of my head answer. It was definitely an honest answer, so that's what we like, yeah. Yeah, um, don't worry, we're I not very politically correct. No, so, we're not. Yeah, we're not no, PC you are, here. But to some extent, I have to be. Um, yes. <laughs> but um, no, the many of my my early childhood memory, like I grew up with British comedy. I was a complete fanatic for Monty Python from the time I was like uh, uh, seven. Oh, fantastic. When they first started, and they used to watch the old black and white shows on TV, and and even Spike Milligan and those guys, and for some reason that when I think of what's funny, I think of like Spike Milligan <laughs> pretending to be a Pakistani, and I know exactly so what you I, mean as well. When yes, I, when I hear people. Um, you know, speaking that way, it just equates in my mind with Spike Milligan and with other funny uh, comedians who <laughs> made a lot of a lot of uh, comedic hay out of. You know, it's not it's Pakistani. It could be Indian. It could be anything. But anything from the you know that that area of the world, I find very Some Asian continent. Yeah, and I, it's just that is what equates. I hear someone speaking that accent, and all I can do is think about Spike Milligan. That's fantastic. <laughs> That's a great answer. Um, so we have a couple of questions that we ask the listeners to send in. Um, gets a little, li little bit more serious, a little bit. And again, some of them you're very welcome to just not answer or tell us to get fucked or whatever. And I know... So this first one kind of is touched a, a lot in the documentary, so you guys need to really go and watch that to get the, the real answers. But um, somebody asked, what is the craziest slash worst slash most despicable thing that you've seen happen in the inner circle of Scientology? Um, I think that the, the worst thing I've seen is a guy basically forced to sit in a chair under a, a very and this this doesn't sound that bad but it ended up being really kind of gruesome uh forced to sit under a air conditioning vent a very high powered air conditioning vent and then had water poured over him and it Ooh, wow. sounds kind of kind of you know a bit like a joke until you start seeing the guy, first of all, shivering and then turning blue in his lips and fingertips turning blue. And like you, I, I literally thought that he was going to keel over from hypothermia and, and Rapid hypothermia. Yeah, that's man, that's brutal. Yeah, that's, yeah. Just a just a side note. What what did that person do to deserve, to deserve, deserve that? Nothing. He was he was uh, refusing to 
admit to something that he was being accused of that he didn't do. Wow. Incredible. That's absolutely crazy. Um, I think we'll move swiftly on from that one, but <laughs> wow, that's, that's, <laughs> yeah, that's incredible. Um, next question was from another listener and they wanted to know, um, obviously you've left very much left the church of Scientology. Do you still hold oh, any of the, do you still hold any of the beliefs? Do they still stay with you at all? Or do you now think that, that all their beliefs are just complete bullshit essentially? Um, okay, that, that's a really good question, and it, it's, it's a bit difficult to answer because I grew up in it. And so when you start talking about beliefs, it, it – look, in Scientology, it is an entire system of, of living life. And so I find myself every now and then going – Oh my God, uh, do I really think that way or do I, should I really be, uh, viewing things that way or reacting that way just because that's how I grew up. That's the, that's the mm. way of looking at the world that I grew up in. And I'm not sure that sometimes I wonder whether it's, I look at it differently than what other people do because I got indoctrinated into the Scientology way of looking at things. I don't. Does the wife keep you more grounded in that respect? Well, she's no different than me. She grew up just the same as I did. Oh, she she was also in the church. Yeah, she was also in the Sea Org. Uh -huh. Okay. Sorry. Yeah, excuse so, my. So, yeah. So so we fucked each other up. <laughs> <laughs> um. Wow. But the simple the the like the big picture answer to that is. No, I don't believe in Scientology. Do right. I believe that everything about it is bad? No. There's a lot of benign stuff in Scientology, much of it taken from other uh, religions or, or thought principles or whatever that uh, are kind of universally held to be true, and I don't think that they hurt anybody. But... Or, you know, if, if you ask me the question, do you consider yourself a Scientologist? The answer is, fuck no. And are your kids ever going to get involved in Scientology? Absolutely fuck no. But <laughs> I, uh, I'm not sure that every vestige of, of, of me looking at the world or how I act or react is Scientology free. Yeah, sure. Would you say it's, it, it's, it makes you a more introspective person? So you, you, you sort of look at the things that, that you do and the way that you live your life in a little more detail than probably I or Macron or sort of normal members of the population would? Well, I hope so. You know, it's pretty hard to answer a question about do you consider yourself more introspective than other people? Um, well, let me just introspect on that for a minute, and I'll give you my answer. Um, it's, it's a cyclic answer, I, I, I know, but, but if, if I explain what I meant by that is, you know, d when you left the Church of Scientology, obviously your mindset changed, and, and did you find yourself then questioning yourself more or less than when you were in the Church, I suppose is a better way of phrasing it. Yeah, I, that, that's a great question, and, I, and certainly the answer to that is more. You know, one thing that you learn in Scientology, or not learn, but one thing that gets inculcated into you in Scientology is a real lack of compassion. They're, they're everything mm -hmm. is very, very, um, here is how you must think, here is how you must act, here is what you should do, here is what you shouldn't do, here is why, and, and all of these theories about why people are the way they are, and if they're bad, why they're bad, and if they're failing, why they're failing, and if they're, you know, poor, why they're poor, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. and it, it, mm. it builds a, a personality that doesn't have much compassion and it those Scientologists will will proclaim their love for mankind and help for the downtrodden and 
the incredible humanity above and beyond what anybody else on earth has ever achieved, you know, kind of rat bag lunatic ravings. The truth of the matter is that isn't what a, a, a true believer, Scientologist, that's not how they see the world. They do not see the world with compassion. They do not see people that they're dealing with with compassion. Pity, yes. They pity people because they're not Scientologists, because they're not as smart as they are because they're not Scientologists, because they're not as successful as they are because they're not Scientologists. Compassion, no. And that's the thing I think that I have tried to, um, I don't know, grow is, is compassion for others. Wow, that, that's a great answer to the question. Thank you. Yeah. Um, it kind of leads me on to the next uh, question, which was from another listener who asks, um, if you had to put a percentage number on it, what percentage of people would you say in Scientology are true believers, truly believe in everything, and what percentage are kind of just aware of how they can milk it for money or use it for their own advantage? Wow, I wouldn't put those two as the two halves of the equation. I would have put it as what percentage do you think are true believers, and which ones, are, and what and the other half of that percentage out of the hundred would be what percentage are just there because of familial connections, because they're afraid of what might happen if they don't carry on, or they just quietly sit in the corner and don't do anything and say anything so as not to piss anybody off. So right. let's just start with that, because I, it's my uh, belief that about 20% of the 25,000 Scientologists in the world are true believers. They are zealots, fundamentalists. They're the, if, if they were uh, jihadists, they'd be the ones that would strap the bombs on themselves and jump on a, on a bus in Israel. Okay. The other 80% are the people who have uh, been raised Scientologists and it's sort of kind of in their DNA, who have uh, family members who are zealots and they don't want to suffer the consequences, whatever that may be, of no longer uh, professing that they, that they are a Scientologist. Uh, people who fear the the policies of disconnection and losing their job or their livelihood, and then just the chicken shits. The sort of people that will never take a stand about anything for fear that by taking a stand, something bad might happen to them, even though that nobody knows what that might be except them in their head. Um, and the second half of that, I can't remember what it was. I think it was the people who uh, see this as just a way of milking others. Yes. That it? Yeah, and kind of out for the money or whatever. I, I, look, money in Scientology is a really big issue. And money is a big issue because uh, it's uh, a measure of success. But there are not a lot of people that are getting rich off Scientology. There's a fuck of a lot of people that have gotten poor off Scientology. But there's not there's not really a lot of people who are getting rich off Scientology. <laughs> Thirty cents an hour. Yeah, that 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 that's a lot of people getting poor on Scientology. But if you go all the way to the even to the top, and you go up to David Miscavige, and and you look at <coughs> And he is different than anybody else in Scientology. He is in a position where he can dictate, I want, uh, you know, four people to polish my shoes, and there'll be four people polishing his shoes, or I want, you know, my salmon flown in from Nova Scotia, and it'll be flown in from Nova Scotia, or, you know, get me a car in this place, or build me a, uh, an apartment there, or whatever. He has the entire resources of a three billion dollar international entity at his disposal he doesn't need personal money he doesn't need to have it's a liability to him to have personal money it's 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 one thing that that the internal revenue service could go after if he had a lot of yeah. personal money 
Now, I'm sure that he has more personal money than, than the average Sea Org member, not, not even in the same ballpark as they say over here. It's in the stratosphere compared to regular Sea Org members. But the truth of the matter is a personality like David Miscavige, his jollies uh, are gotten by his control of people and whether he can exercise yeah. domination and control over them. And a way that you can measure your ability to exercise domination and control over someone is if you can get them to do things that are not in their own best interests. And handing over shitloads of money or taking out second mortgages or whatever, uh, things that are, that appear to be for the purpose of just getting the money, really it's for the, for the satisfaction of having gotten someone to give you stuff that is more harmful to them than it is helpful to you. So it sounds like it's a lot more about power would be the word than money. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, it, that, 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 that's my opinion of it. And, and I, you know, I, I form my opinions based on a lot of experience. I'm not always right, but I have a pretty good sense of things when it comes to Scientology. So another, Given the so size of the organization and, and obviously, you know, not wanting to expose himself to the authorities tax wise and um, and so on. Do you believe in sort of Machiavellian Bond villain style that he's possibly redirecting uh, or has redirected funds as a contingency elsewhere in the world? Should the whole thing ever blow up and he, he wants to disappear? I think I think that 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 is uh, a high likelihood, um, but I, I you know in the overall scheme of things, if it was fifty million dollars, that's chicken feed in the the big picture of Scientology. Yeah. Yeah. So I mean, the next question I was going to ask kind of leads perfectly onto that, and going kind of way before all that, do you think L. Ron Hubbard ever really believed any of his own bullshit, or do you think it was all kind of set up from the beginning? I, I actually do think he believed his own bullshit, sadly. I mean, I think that there was a lot of it that, uh, in, the early, in the early days that was uh, almost, um, you know, nod, nod, wink, wink, uh, you know what I mean, you know what I mean, uh, if people will buy this, well, yeah, good, good, that, that's going to be, that's going to be really good for me, and uh, as time went on, I mean, the guy ended up dying in a fucking motorhome, still mm. doing his Scientology shit on himself, trying to save himself. Wow. You know, maybe he had a stroke, uh, didn't he? What? He had a stroke, didn't he? Several. Yeah. Wow, okay. And he was Sorry. still trying to solve his problems by getting rid of, of this invention that he had called body thetans. <laughs> and, you know, uh, you, getting rid of them with an e-meter. <laughs> wow, and I guess that didn't work too well for him in the end. <laughs> well, it didn't seem to. No. Wow. But, um, but if, like, you would think that if he didn't really believe his own bullshit, at some point, like, well, well why keep a acting the part? Why, sure. why carry on? Why not just go off and buy yourself an island and and you know live it up like Richard Branson? Like, why, why seclude yourself in a fucking motorhome in a in some place in the middle of California, when nobody knows where you are and basically die in a ditch? Right. Attrition. <laughs> Maybe. Uh, what did you say? Attrition. Attrition for ruining so many people's lives, for ru ruining so uh, well, many families. For it, who who knows? I don't know. The, I don't know the 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 motivation or the the um, 
you, you know, how, how it came about. But the question is, was he still a believer? Well, at least he had all the trappings of still being a believer. He was doing it to the end with the apparent hope that this is what was going to save him. Wow. That's, that's crazy. Um, we just have a couple more questions before we'll uh, get out of your hair. Um, the last one is from another, another listener. It's kind of compounded, but um, uh, somebody wanted to know, uh, and I'll quote his exact words, what can the average jerk on the internet do to, one, help Scientology's tax-exempt status get revoked, to two, help you in your mission, and to three, stay out of Scientology's crosshairs? Well, the answer to number three is don't do number one or two. Right. <laughs> <laughs> That's fantastic. And the answer to number one and two is the average jerk on the internet, you know, it depends where you are. If you're in the United States, then you have a right to contact your elected representative and let your voice be heard about what you think they should and shouldn't do about all sorts of issues, including whether Scientology should have tax exempt status and whether the abuses of Scientology should be allowed to continue. So you can, you can always write to your elected representative or tweet or call or do whatever. If you're outside of the U.S., that, you know, those options are much more limited. What you can do is tell your friends to watch our show. Like tweet about it. Keep it keep it current. Like when it comes back on the air. Tweet and and get your friends to watch it. And because the more people that watch, you know, we've had an enormous amount of people who have reached out to us having watched that first season. And some of them are people who, you know, I can't go into great detail about, but they work in positions that they have the ability to do something about it. And it's funny, the six degrees of separation that you find, uh, wow, you know, my niece told me to watch this show, and uh, I'm, I happen to be married to... Uh, the daughter of the head of the FBI, you know, like, or, and, and that's just a hypothetical example. I'm just saying those things happen. And then suddenly it sort of is raised in the consciousness of everybody. And it becomes, you know, Scientology has moved from the, su the subject that everybody was afraid to, to talk about at all to the subject that people now are becoming sort of afraid to not decry. That if you're not taking a, a, a position against the abuses of Scientology, then you're some sort of a Neanderthal. It's kind of like, you know, back in the 50s, nobody came out and supported gay rights. These days, if you're, a, if you're like anti-gay, you're a pariah. And everybody, uh, you know, all the way from Donald Trump to the, the most right-wing lunatics come out and now say, oh, well, I, of course I support, support gay rights. You know, it's, and that's what's changing and that public perception changing then brings about the activity that will ultimately be the downfall of Scientology in my view. Right. Okay. Let's hope so. Eventually. Yeah. Absolutely. Yes. Um, uh, can can sorry, I can I just ask one, one question? Ha, ha, on a day to day basis, how yeah. much hindrance does the Scientology movement cause you? As in, I, I saw the documentaries. Uh, I, I think when you were still in Florida, yeah. I think you were in, it, pretty near where I was then in Boca. And you had like guys outside your house in minivans watching with cameras and things. How much of a, a, a daily hindrance are they to you? Uh, not much. They, they, don't, they don't bother too much anymore. I think they got tired of me taking videos of them. Right. <laughs> wow. Um, so the last and final question before I um, get out of your hair, and this is one that I thought of myself. It's kind oh, wow. of a... Uh, Oh yeah, I did some work myself. 
Um, oh, this is kind of a philosophical question, maybe possibly aimed at some of our younger listeners, but the question was, um, if you could take back the years that you lost to Scientology, um, knowing what you know now, what would you do with your time? Um, yeah, that's a fascinating question. Nobody's ever, never asked me that before. I think that probably uh, if, if I hadn't uh, done what I did, I would have gone the, you know, like when I was in high school, I got a scholarship to go to university and I probably would have gone to university and I think I probably would have ended up being a lawyer. Okay. Well. And, uh, and hopefully a lawyer who, who helps people whose rights have been, you know, uh, I, I don't mean just violated, getting people <laughs> off, off, off drunk driving charges. I, I mean, someone that, that could make a difference to, to people who are not, who have no voice in society. I mean, I have always, even when I was in Scientology, I believe that I was was doing something to try to make a better world and I believe now that the work on the show or the shows or whatever I do in my little you know my little world of of activism against Scientology abuses is to try to make um, a better a better world or a place for people who who are getting are getting shafted right now to no longer be getting shafted. Okay. Okay. Wow. You're um, a good man. You're yeah. a good man, Mike. And I, I have one final question. Are we uh, are we definitely on for dinner when you're in London? Oh, absolutely, guys. Absolutely. Excellent. Okay. Yeah, just um, Macron will start. Yeah, yeah, well, we'll we'll, uh, we'll we'll go to Westminster Bridge. So we're near Westminster Bridge. <coughs> Wait for the next terror attack. <coughs> yeah, ho hopefully I won't be so close next time. But uh, yeah, hopefully. yeah, definitely next. You know, let us know your travel plans when you're in London. We'll uh, we'll get together. We'll have some dinner and talk some more. Um, but thank yeah, you so it. much for being being a good sport and being on the show. It's been absolutely fascinating for me personally to ask these questions and uh yeah we're just all very grateful thank you so much well well you're very welcome guys and uh, and like i said to you you know in in between times i i kind of enjoyed our first interaction i told you i'd be on so i like to live up to my word and i actually thoroughly enjoyed it brilliant thank you so much you're a star. Do you want to mention your website or, or plug anything before you uh, get off the line? Um, I mean, I have a I have a little blog that's kind of uh, very very specialized to people who have an interest in the subject of Scientology. It's MikeRindersBlog.org. That's it. Great. So everyone, please check that out if you're interested in learning more and. Um, yeah, I think that's everything. Um, thank you so much again for being on. We we really appreciate it, and um, yeah, we're gonna uh, gonna go off and try and make our attempt at doing some comedy now. <laughs> so, uh, okay. um, I'm very much looking forward to actually shaking your hand in London. Yes, well, the the feeling is mutual. Wow. Thank okay. You so have, much. A, have a good day there, you. Cheers. Take care, Mike. Cheers. Bye bye. Bye. Bye bye. bye, -bye.